On this episode of Assignment Discovery, witness the campaign launched by the FBI to destroy the 1964 Civil Rights Act and one American citizen in the Johnson tapes on civil liberties. Hear the private conversations of some of America's most influential political players and explore their secret world of political cover-ups. And for lesson plans on race, go online to discoveryschool.com. Consider this before viewing the Johnson Tapes on Civil Liberties, Part 1. Abuse of power can exist at all levels of the government. Look for evidence of abuse of power in the events surrounding President Johnson's push to get the 1964 Civil Rights Act passed. Think about the actions of other powerful figures, such as J. Edgar Hoover, Robert F. Kennedy, and Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Assignment Discovery now presents The Johnson Tapes, Uncivil Liberties, Part 1. In the basement of Washington's Masonic Temple is a shrine that is closed to the public. It's a memorial to one of America's most powerful men, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI and a close friend of President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, but I didn't want this opportunity to go by without telling you again how proud I am of you and how glad I am that Uncle Sam's got you working for us. And uh, uh, if you just think that you're going to get off the payroll because you're getting a little older, you're crazy as hell. I don't retire the FBI. This is the story of how Hoover used all the resources and power of the FBI to try and destroy one man, Dr. Martin Luther King the very man Johnson needed as an ally to secure passage of the landmark 1964 Civil Rights Bill. Legislation, the president felt, was long overdue. Looks like it's about time to stop talking. I just think that we're going to have them out in the streets again if we don't, uh, don't make some little progress. Civil rights reforms would be stopped in their tracks if Hoover's plans to destroy King succeeded. The course of modern American history hung in the balance. Hoover's plot took place in a twilight world, away from the cameras, so actors have been used to illustrate many of the scenes in this film. But telephone calls between President Johnson and key players in the drama were recorded at the time. These real calls are what you'll hear in the film. of this story go back to August 1963. Three months before Lyndon Johnson became president, 200,000 people gathered in Washington for the biggest civil rights demonstration in U.S. history. JFK was still in office. After a summer of direct nonviolent action in the Deep South, Black leaders decided to raise their campaign to a national level with a march on Washington. It was this event that raised a 34-year-old black preacher from Georgia to the leadership of the Civil Rights Movement. I have a dream. That my four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. It became one of the seminal speeches of the century, but it also divided the country at large, the Congress, and the Justice Department. When we allow freedom ring, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That was a uh, wonderfully moving and eloquent speech. It had an enormously a uh, positive effect uh, in the country at large, but also in the White House with the president, Kennedy, with the attorney general. 
as they thought it was a magnificent speech. That wasn't the assessment of the FBI. Hoover, convinced King was a subversive, ordered his counterintelligence unit to watch the speech, draft a report for him, assessing the danger. Negroes constitute the greatest single racial target of the Communist Party USA. I believe in the light of King's powerful demagogic speech that he stands head and shoulders above all Negro leaders put together when it comes to influencing great masses of Negroes. We must mark him now as the most dangerous Negro in this country. Three months later, John Kennedy was dead and Lyndon Johnson was president. The succession pleased Hoover. The Kennedys had disliked him and he saw Johnson as a friend and a southerner with an ambiguous record on civil rights. One of Johnson's first telephone calls from the Oval Office was to Hoover. You're more than the head of the Federal Bureau, as far as I'm concerned. You're my brother and personal friend, right. and you have been for 25, 30 years. So I got more confidence in your judgment than anybody in town. I certainly appreciate your confidence. So, thank you. What Hoover could not have known was that as president, Johnson would make the enactment of a new and radical civil rights bill his overriding priority. Introduced by John Kennedy, it had been stuck in Congress for months. On his third day in the White House, Johnson telephoned Martin Luther King, who had spoken well of the new president in public. A good many people told me that they uh, heard about your statement, I guess, on TV, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, I, uh -huh. I, I, I've been locked up in this office, and I haven't seen it, but I won't tell you how grateful I am and how, uh, how worthy I'm going to try to be of all your hopes. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to hear that, and I knew that you had just that great spirit, and you know you have our support and backing, well, because we know what a difficult period this is. I think one of the great uh, tributes that we can pay in memory of President Kennedy is to try to enact some of the great uh, progressive policies that he sought to initiate. Well, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that, and I'm going to do my best to get other men to do likewise, and I'll have to have y'all's help. I well, never needed more than I do now. Well, you know you have it, and just feel free to call on us for anything. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, thank you. Johnson knew how to cut deals, but to get a civil rights bill passed, he'd have to walk a tightrope. On the one hand, he would need the support of Martin Luther King. As leader of all those vivid and persuasive demonstrations in the South, King had helped create the climate in which middle America would accept a radical civil rights bill. But on the other hand, Johnson would have to drag the Congress along. That meant drawing on his legendary political skills to create a coalition willing to tear down apartheid in America. He knew it wasn't going to be easy. Johnson knew many in Congress would vigorously oppose the Civil Rights Bill. Like a general preparing for battle, he asked the liberal Senator Hubert Humphrey to mobilize support. Now, do you think you got this civil rights in decent shape? Yes, sir. Mr. President, we've got a much better bill than anybody even dreamed possible. We haven't weakened this bill one damn bit. My God, we're going so far in this bill that it'll be the greatest advance in a hundred years. Of course it will. Of course it will. Well, now, what you've got to do is tell these leadership people that this one thing, the thing that we are more afraid of than anything else, is that we'll have real revolution in this country when this bill goes into effect. And unless we have the Republicans joining us, we'll have mutiny in this goddamn country. Right. Well, you're doing a wonderful job, though. And I think stay on this one, though. Yes, sir. All right. All right. To force the Civil Rights Bill through the Senate, where opposition was strongest, Johnson needed to build a cross-party coalition of moderates. He had to be willing to break with some of his closest personal friends in politics, especially the leader of the Southern Democrats, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia. Senator Russell and the president sat knee to knee on the second floor of the White House. And I remember Lyndon Johnson saying, he says, Dick, I love you and I owe you, but I got to tell you, Dick, don't get in my way on this civil rights bill, because if you do, I'm going to run you down. And Dick Russell in that soft, rolling, southern tone says, well, Mr. President, you very well may be right, but if you are, you will lose the South forever. And then I remember 
president saying to him, in another soft voice, leaning toward Russell, he says, Dick, if that's the price I've got to pay, then I'll gladly pay it. Johnson's other intimate friend, Edgar Hoover, also stood for the opposite of what Johnson was trying to achieve. Hoover sat at the head of a resolutely white FBI. To him, black civil rights leaders were left-wing agitators, probably in the pay of the Kremlin. In the eyes of their Soviet comrades, the communists in this country have a vital role in the march toward world enslavement. They are, by Nikita Khrushchev's own description, a valuable arm of the international conspiracy against God and freedom. And the sooner every American faces this fact, the stronger our position will be. We must shed our complacency and aggressively meet this challenge. Under Hoover, the FBI had become a political police force that used bugging, telephone tapping, burglary, and forgery, all in the name of internal security. Hoover had set up a special unit to watch Martin Luther King in August 1963. It reported that the American Communist Party had secretly planted two senior members inside King's inner circle. One was a Jewish lawyer named Stanley Levison. The other was a former young socialist, Clarence Jones. Was I ever, in fact, a member, a card-carrying member of the Communist Party? The answer is no. It's not as if Martin King could be led by the nose by a Stanley Levison or by a Clarence Jones. That's absolutely nonsense. Martin King, to Hoover, was a Negro that he couldn't control. In October 1963, without providing any evidence of communist infiltration, Hoover had persuaded Attorney General Robert Kennedy to authorize telephone taps on Dr. King and the two subversives with whom he was allegedly consorting. Kennedy agreed to a trial period of one month's secret surveillance. By the time Robert Kennedy's authorization ran out, Johnson was president. But Hoover quietly kept the taps in place. The watch on King was codenamed Operation Zorro. And assistant director William Sullivan was put in charge of Hoover's special unit. A nine-hour meeting produced an expanded action plan. It ranged from the use of hidden microphones in hotel rooms used by King to the planting of prostitutes as secretaries in his offices. There was no discussion of contact with communists, a field of inquiry the FBI had quickly abandoned as unrewarded. Instead, they decided to focus on King's private life in the hope of, quote, exposing King as an immoral opportunist. Arthur Murtaugh, then a field agent in the FBI's Atlanta office, was a member of the team. Hoover wanted it done. I don't think there was any justification of it at all. There wasn't anything... We had no information that uh, King was in any way uh, un-American or uh, in violation of the law. Uh, the Bureau was interested in destroying him because uh, Hoover wanted him destroyed. The FBI's operation now moved from Washington to Atlanta. There, King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was placed under 24-hour surveillance. In December 1963, FBI agents set up shop in an unoccupied building on the opposite side of the street. Everyone entering and leaving was photographed, including King, who was to be followed wherever he went. The agents involved all knew the objective, to gather evidence Hoover could use to destroy King as a civil rights leader. They started off hating him because he was black. The agents that I was working with on this particular squad had been brought up to believe that uh, all black people were dangerous, that they were uh, uh, dishonest, that they lacked character, that they were uh, sexual perverts, uh, all kinds of uh, hatred. Murtaugh says it was the most extensive surveillance operation ever undertaken by the FBI. Inside the Bureau's Atlanta headquarters, 10 agents assigned to the case were given their own separate area. 
In one room, agents recorded all telephone calls to and from the SCLC offices in King's home on nearby Johnson Street. In another room, again according to Murtaugh, Hoover's G-men busied themselves by dreaming up imaginative schemes to entrap the Reverend King. Whether the new president knew what his friend Hoover was up to, we do not know. What is clear is that while Hoover was trying to sabotage progress on civil rights, Johnson was doing everything he could to promote it. He telephoned Kay Graham, publisher of the Washington Post. The president wanted the Post to attack Republicans who were blocking his bill's progress by refusing to sign a petition allowing debate. Now, every person that doesn't sign that petition has got to be fairly regarded as being anti-civil rights. But I don't think any American can say it. He won't let them have a hearing. That is worse than Hitler did. So we've got to get ready for that, and we've got to get ready every day, front page, in and out, individuals, why are you against a hearing? And point them up and have their pictures and have editorials and have everything else that uh, is in a dignified way for a hearing on the floor. It was now Christmas time, and after four exhilarating weeks in power, the president was spending the holiday at his Texas ranch with Lady Bird and the girls, Linda Bird and Lucy Baines. With his civil rights bill uppermost in his mind, Johnson now hit on the novel idea of inviting half a dozen black leaders and their wives to stay at the ranch. From the ranch, he called his civil rights advisor at the White House, Lee White. Lee, uh, this little risky, but I want to get your judgment on it. I thought we might invite Roy Wilkins and Farmer and Luther King to come down here and talk to me about my State of the Union message, just bring them deep in the heart of Texas, and have them at my home, and have uh, have lunch with me. And if you want to bring one of the women, uh, bring one of those Negro women. I think it'd be a pretty dramatic thing for the nation to just have them in my home and have them talking to me about the State of the Union message. Thank you, Lee. Unfortunately, a winter storm intervened. The excursion was canceled. Instead, King and the others were invited to meet the president at the White House after the holiday. From New York, Clarence Jones booked a suite for King at the Willard Hotel in Washington. The FBI intercepted the call. On the afternoon of January 5th, Special Agent L.W.P. Cherndorf led a three-man team on an illegal break-in at the Willard. Operation Zorro now took a significant turn. For the first time, the FBI agents actually deployed hidden microphones, seven altogether, all designed to entrap King by finding out what he might do in the privacy of his hotel bedroom. I had to assume that they would be tapping him and watching him and under surveillance, so he should be careful, all right? Uh, I don't think he had any idea I certainly didn't, of the magnitude or the detail of the surveillance. I think if he had, I think he would have been petrified. Early next morning, January 6th, 1964, King left his Atlanta office for Washington. FBI Atlanta passed his arrival time to FBI Washington, 10.24 a.m. King was observed at National Airport. After checking in at the Willard Hotel, King left for the White House, where he joined three other black leaders. Uh, I think the president uh, is doing a very good job in civil rights. He has made it clear publicly and privately that he's committed to civil rights in general and to the civil rights bill in particular. And from all indications, he plans to take a forthright stand on this issue and a very consistent one. So as it stands now, we feel that the president is doing a good job. As James Farmer recalls, the meeting was designed to show that this president was serious about civil rights. Come right in, Mr. Farmer. Uh, sit down in that big chair. That's a Texas-sized chair. Uh, and as he was jerking my arm out of the socket, his phone rang. Uh, he answered it. It was some senator uh, calling, returning his call. And he was twisting this caller's arm, trying to get him to commit himself to vote for the civil rights bill. 
Now, you either for civil rights or you're not. You're either the party of Lincoln or you ain't. And that's about God put up or shut up. And we've been talking about this for 100 years. Looks like it's about time to stop talking. Right. Now, I just think that we're going to have them out in the streets again if we don't uh, don't make some little progress. In fact, got to make it. He was doing all that he could. And all the while, he was throwing a glance at me to make sure that I was uh, listening. So here was the liberal Lyndon Johnson leading America into a social revolution. And there was the head of his federal police force going all out to frustrate him. Friends of Martin Luther King say that on his travels in the South, King never felt physically safe. But at the Willard Hotel in Washington, King thought he could relax. King didn't know about the listening post the FBI had set up in an adjoining suite. For 17 hours, agents recorded conversation between King and several colleagues and visitors, two of whom were women. Clarence Jones, who was there, does not deny that King had sex during his stay. He blames King for falling into an FBI trap. Putting aside the morality of the issue, it's a question of the politics of the issue. The politics of the issue was that it was, uh, it was politically irresponsible. It was politically dangerous because it was feeding right into the hands of the FBI, giving them grist that they would, you know, to use against them that they otherwise would not have had. Let me just say this. Whatever occurred during that 17-hour period in that hotel suite that, uh, that concerned Hoover, that was between Martin King and his family and Martin King and his guy. William Sullivan and Edgar Hoover went through the tapes together. The bugging team was told it had unearthed enough to destroy Dr. King. Hoover ordered a full transcript to be made and a summary to be hand-carried to the White House. An internal memo suggests it was shown to Walter Jenkins, White House Chief of Staff, and the President. I find it shocking uh, that the Bureau would do that, uh, that the Bureau would not only do that, but would go to the seat of government, uh, the White House, and feel free uh, to sort of boast about it. Uh, I find it shocking uh, that, th that the White House would have gone along. The White House or President Johnson? Neither in the LBJ telephone tapes nor in other available records is there any evidence pointing to Johnson's involvement. If he did read the Willard Hotel bedroom transcripts, he would not have wanted them to be leaked. Clarence Jones explains why. If that kind of information had come out, it would have been used to discredit Martin King, would have been used to discredit the Civil Rights Movement, would have been used as a very, and probably effectively used, as a smokescreen to say, you see the kind of people who really want these civil rights, you see the kind of people they really are, you're not dealing with people who are, who are, who are legitimately oppressed, you're not dealing with people who are people of character or of good morality and all this and all this moral plea to the consciousness. Look at the kind of people they are. They're people who are communists. They're people who engage in the, in the, in the so-called immoral activities. I think it would have been devastating. Johnson knew that leaking dirt on King would doom his civil rights bill. It would have provided ammunition to the Southern Democrats who were already engaged in what was becoming the longest filibuster in Senate history. That didn't stop the FBI. Now that you've seen the Johnson tapes on Civil Liberties, Part 1, talk about this. Analyze the possible reasons why J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, sought to discredit Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Do you think Hoover's motives were personal, racist, or political? Explain the reasons for your answer. Now try this. Imagine you are a newspaper editor in 1964. The story of the FBI's unorthodox surveillance of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. has just surfaced. 
write an editorial to accompany this breaking news. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to support the Johnson Tapes on Civil Liberties. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests The Last Crusade by Gerald D. McKnight. Consider this before viewing the Johnson Tapes on Civil Liberties Part 2. What do you know about the function of the FBI within the U.S. government? As you watch the program, think about the activities of the FBI during the Civil Rights Movement. Was the FBI overstepping its boundaries in the name of national security? When does an investigation become an invasion of privacy? Assignment Discovery now presents The Johnson Tapes on Civil Liberties, Part 2. The success of the Willard Hotel sting stimulated Hoover's appetite. More than a dozen FBI field offices were drawn into Operation Zorro as King traveled across America from Hawaii to New York. And FBI records show or claim that he was caught in at least two more illicit sexual encounters. On March 9th, the President and Hoover spent four hours together in the Oval Office. The FBI director could have used the time to brief Johnson on King's immoral activity, but he now had a worry of his own. Hoover, after four decades at the head of the FBI, was nearly 65 and facing mandatory retirement. If Johnson had wanted to get rid of the powerful director, this was the time to do it. But LBJ relished the titillating gossip brought to him by Hoover and wasn't about to abandon his friend now. J. Edgar Hoover celebrates his 40th year as head of the FBI. The FBI chief will reach retirement age this year. But President Johnson has signed a bill permitting him to stay on. It's a happy anniversary for Mr. Hoover. I'm very proud to join in this tribute to one of America's most outstanding public servants, J. Edgar Hoover. We are especially fortunate to have Mr. Hoover's strong personal dedication to maintaining the high standards of protection for civil liberties of the individual under our system of law. By June 64, with Senate action on civil rights still stalled, the struggle was moving into the streets. As Johnson had feared, the Deep South was in ferment, with thousands of black and white students from the North flooding into states like Mississippi to force the pace of radical reform. To the Southern white establishment, it was an invasion of left-wing radicals. The hardcore of this group are your beatnik type people. Long beards, ringlets of hair on the back of the neck, down almost to the shoulder blade. Uh, strictly non-conforming. Uh, some of them, if you would call weirdos. In Jackson, his state capital, the governor recruited a hundred extra men for riot control and bought them an armored car, 200 shotguns, and gas masks. We are going to see to it that law and order is maintained and maintained uh, Mississippi style. Dr. King, meanwhile, intensified his own grassroots campaign to secure passage of the Civil Rights Bill. In June, he traveled to America's oldest city, St. Augustine, Florida. The town was a stronghold of the Ku Klux Klan. Many of its members had been sworn in as special deputies by the sheriff an outspoken segregationist. For King, that made it a perfect place from which to keep the struggle on the nation's television screens and ratchet up the pressure on Washington. Unknown to King, a squad of FBI men had followed him from Atlanta. On arrival, they telexed Washington for permission to plant the usual devices in a cottage King had rented in the white section of the segregated town. When King demanded the desegregation of beaches and swimming pools, hotels, and lunch counters, local whites denounced him as, quote, an outside nigger and a communist. When he received
received death threats, he went to a local church and announced that he would stay in the town. We have gone too far now to turn back. And we will not be content until the sagging walls of segregation have been crushed all over this community by the battering rams of the forces of justice. King intended his presence in St. Augustine to attract the media, national as well as local. Cameras were there to catch whites beating black kids trying to swim at local beaches. The networks were there when pickets tried to integrate a local restaurant, hoping a well-publicized incident would swing public opinion in favor of the civil rights bill. And when the media reported that somebody had opened fire on King's rented cottage, he was away for the day, the president was forced to act. He called Florida Senator George Smathers. What about San Augustine? They're giving me uncharted hell on that. And is San Augustine a pretty bad place? No, no. San Augustine, it's a, it's a typically rural place. They say they're shooting into King's white man's house down there. He's demanding we go in. My own judgment is that this is a damn plant. King is, naturally, he loves the headlines. And uh, the facts show that when he was there, there was nothing was was at all shot at in the night that he announced publicly he was going to leave. It was then shot into, and the next night he was back there, and nobody's bothered him at all. That's not how King's supporters saw it. They viewed the white backlash as providing a chance to press home the need for a civil rights bill. As King well knew, direct federal intervention was not a step Johnson would take lightly. And as Johnson knew, King was being deliberately provocative. With reporters in attendance, King now led a group of activists to an all-white motel, the Monson Motor Lodge. Fighting broke out when five young blacks and two whites dove into the segregated swimming pool. The manager counterattacked with plastic jugs of an acid cleaner. King ain't got me yet, fellas. This friend is the king and his non-violent army is the biggest joke I've heard of. He's not broke the spirit of this community. We just getting right here right now. So you can tell the people that. Altogether, 34 demonstrators were arrested, including Dr. King. He was charged with violating Florida's unwelcome guest laws and spent three days in jail. On the fourth day, he was released and left for Yale University to receive an honorary degree. Next day, June 19th, was another bad day for Hoover, but a triumph for Johnson and also for King. The Senate filibuster was finally defeated, and with it, the only remaining obstacle to passage of the 64 Civil Rights Bill. Johnson called Roy Wilkins a prominent civil rights leader. I haven't got the official news yet. I've been at a... 73 to, 20, to 73 to 27. 73 to 27? Yeah. Mr. President, that's very good news. Well, you're a mighty good man. You deserve all the credit, and I sure do salute you, and I'm mighty proud of you. Mr. President? Our trouble is just beginning. I guess you know that. Yes, I know. Uh, I won't take some leadership, but I'm just afraid of what's going to happen this summer, like I saw yesterday at uh, St. Augustine. What Johnson had been watching on television was the white backlash in St. Augustine. Second, the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, outlawing institutionalized segregation, was approved by Congress and signed into law in the East Room of the White House. Dr. King was victorious, now the undisputed leader of black Americans 
He was placed close to the president's chair. Also there, but on the sidelines, was the bill's first casualty, J. Edgar Hoover. Hello, Edgar. Glad to see you, my man. Indisputably, the law of the land was now on the side of Martin Luther King. Despite this, the nation's chief law enforcement officer did not call off his vendetta. A written FBI directive said this. We must intensify our coverage of King, this moral degenerate. The main goal is to neutralize or completely discredit the effectiveness of King as a Negro leader. Nowhere in the FBI records is there a single suggestion that any of King's private actions violated the law. But for America's chief law enforcement officer, that didn't seem to matter. On the 15th of July, Hoover's agents went to the Bell Company's Atlanta switching center and doubled the number of taps on the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's telephone lines. FBI men monitoring calls between Coretta King and her absent husband noticed that his frequent travels were straining their marriage. Telex to Hoover said this. There is increased evidence of marital discord in the King family. The current situation could conceivably result in a breach between the principals. Or better still, a divorce, which the FBI hoped would cause a scandal. Armed with a permit called a trash recovery order, signed by the chief himself, the agents now delved into trash cans outside King's Atlanta headquarters. They were looking for a sample of the handwriting of Andrew Young, the movement's personable office manager. Once found, the forgers went to work. They took the handwriting, duplicated it, wrote all kinds of messages uh, to Mrs. King, uh, trying to make it appear that uh, people who were very close in his own personal circle were involved uh, sexually with his wife, trying to get warfare going between the players in the, in the King camp. King was spending two weeks at home in Atlanta working on a book. FBI men monitoring his phone calls could hardly contain their excitement when they overheard King planning to visit a woman friend. Well, there was some indication that King's going to see this particular woman for illicit sex. They had an elaborate scheme. I was in the office that night, I remember. And uh, they made the call to the fire department from the office and told them that there was a fire in this house. As agents watched from a car across the street, the Atlanta Fire Department became an unwitting accomplice in the FBI campaign to make King's life unbearable. They raided the house. Uh, King came out, got in his car and went home. Compared with what was to come, those were merely dirty tricks. A crisis in the White House was to put the president in Hoover's debt, allowing the FBI to attempt to get Dr. King to kill himself. In the fall of 1964, Lyndon Johnson was unassailable. His record of legislative achievement outshone even Franklin Roosevelt's. His election by a landslide was a certainty. Then, a month before Election Day, a political lightning bolt struck the White House and forced the president to appeal for help to King's tormentor, J. Edgar Hoover. On the evening of October 7th, the White House Chief of Staff, Walter Jenkins, left his office at the end of an 18-hour day and walked to the nearby YMCA. There, he was caught in a restroom with another man and arrested on a morals charge. Thirty years ago, it didn't do to be gay, certainly not in high places. Jenkins was not only one of the few who had seen the FBI files on Dr. King. For years, he had been the keeper of Johnson's personal secrets, as well as weighty matters of state, and could have been open to blackmail. Lyndon Johnson was always inclined to panic at election time. Promptly, he accepted Jenkins' resignation. Over in California, the president's Republican opponent, Senator Barry Goldwater, saw the opening Johnson feared. He accused the president of knowingly employing a homosexual in one of the most sensitive posts in Washington. And when other Republicans floated the story that a second homosexual was hiding in Johnson's cabinet, the president called Hoover to ask how to spot a closet homosexual. 
But instead of initiating a witch hunt within Johnson's cabinet, Hoover ordered his staff to put together a report on King's sex life. When news broke that Martin Luther King had won the world's most prestigious honor, the Nobel Peace Prize, it drove Hoover into a frenzy. The FBI's Domestic Intelligence Division prepared a book entitled Martin Luther King Jr., His Personal Conduct. A copy was sent to Bill Moyers, the president's deputy chief of staff, with a letter asking permission to send the book to members of the cabinet. Moyers agreed. Copies were sent to the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, to Robert McNamara at the Pentagon, and to John McCone, director of the CIA. But Hoover wanted to share his files on King with the public. He ordered his staff to use their contacts in the press to get the story out. A senior FBI agent was assigned to call the chief Washington correspondent of the Los Angeles Times, David Craslow. He told me that Dr. King was a notorious womanizer and that he'd had a number of sexual escapades and that they, uh, the Bureau, had proof of this. And uh, he says, well, let me read you a portion of one, one of these uh, tapes. And he began to read from a transcript. Uh, the raunchiness is beyond description. What shocked me was I knew that he was high enough up in the hierarchy of the Bureau that this could not have been done without Hoover's blessing. It's none of their business. It was none of their business. If, in fact, they were trying to find out whether King was associating with known communists, uh, that might have had some relevance. But to, to simply pry into his private life, his, his alleged sexual conduct or misconduct, is no relevance whatever. It was despicable. No reporter would touch the story. By now, the countdown to election day had begun. The Jenkins scandal was robbing the president of sleep. He feared it would deny him a landslide victory. He need not have worried. Hoover, anxious to court favor at the White House, ensured that an FBI report clearing the president of any suspicion of carelessness was duly leaked to the press. Mr. Hoover on 2383. Hello? Edgar? Yes, sir. I thought that uh, you did a, a very thorough, very fine job. I, I'm very grateful for uh, for your thoroughness and your, your patriotism and the way you've handled it as I am everything else you've ever done. Of course, uh, I realize the spot that you've been in and the terrible uppercut you've had, and it's awful to have this thing happen, but uh, uh, I think we, well, we handled it with uh, compassion, and uh, I think the man is a desperately ill man. Yes, you're a compassionate man, an understanding man, and... Uh, From the Bible, you know, it's uh, careful about throwing the first stone uh, unless you have seen yourself. You know, Billy Graham called me and said, just remember this, always be compassionate, but do your duty. Well, of course, there's so damn many, so damn many hypocrites, you know. That's right. Particularly in the press in this country. That's right. Which are just like vultures. You just, uh, you just remember, my friend, I'm prouder of you now than I've ever been before, but I've known for 30 years that there's nobody like you, and as long as I'm around here, you got to stay pretty close. Well, well I can. So that's okay, my friend. Fine, thank you. His own position strengthened by the helpful role he played in the Jenkins crisis, Hoover now returned to his attack on Dr. King. He specifically invited female reporters to his office for a background chat. He talked of the need for moral purity in public life. And then stressing that his next remark was on the record, he called Dr. King the most notorious liar in the country. The remark appeared in print. When the news magazines picked up the story, at least one civil rights leader called for Hoover's resignation. King himself remarked publicly that the FBI chief must be suffering from overwork. But in a phone call to a friend, King called Hoover senile. And when the FBI eavesdroppers put that in their logs, Hoover retaliated in a barely coded speech in Chicago. When man places himself above the law, he aids the communist relentless effort to destroy the ideals of our civilization. The man who has no objective values by which he judges his actions, who allows his passions to run wild, unchecked by a moral standard of what is right, that man is surely risking the loss of his immortal soul. 
Hoover's men now undertook an operation they knew to be both unauthorized and illegal. Sullivan took his favorite King surveillance tapes to the FBI's audio labs where a senior technician transferred the most incriminating parts to a single reel. A third agent flew with the tape to Miami Beach and posted it from there to the King family home in Atlanta together with a bizarre anonymous letter. FBI Atlanta was secretly listening in on Dr. King's home telephone lines to confirm that the package had arrived safely. Martin called and said, uh, uh, better come over. I want you to hear something that uh, Mr. Hoover has sent us. And uh, so I went over the next day and uh, we sat down and listened to the tape. And, and uh, we never listened to all of it because it became boring. But about 90% of it was inaudible. It was clear evidence of the extreme desperation of Mr. Hoover to destroy Martin. And uh, Martin didn't tell me over the phone that there was a note accompanied that suggested he ought to take his own life. Years later, a handwritten copy of that note was found in William Sullivan's desk at the FBI. Here is part of it. King, look into your heart. You're no clergyman and you know it. Like all frauds, your end is approaching. Lean your ears to the enclosure to your hideous abnormality. There's only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do it. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bad to the nation. When we read that, we were furious with Mr. Hoover. We had prayer. And then we, we, we laughed at it. Uh, how ignorant, how uh, unaware they were of the depth of our commitment to the struggle. To think that that that, that kind of gossip and slander would drive Dr. King to take his own life. No evidence has been unearthed suggesting Hoover ever told the president about his last-ditch effort to dispose of Dr. King, nor was anything as outrageous ever tried again. But the FBI bugging continued all through the Johnson years until the day King was murdered in 1968. The uh, FBI at the time was an institution was out of control. It was a lawless institution, uh, from its own point of view even. And it was directed by a man who I think was truly demented. The existence of the King surveillance tapes only became public knowledge in 1975, three years after Hoover's death. A court subsequently ruled that their content be sealed until the year 2027. The existence of the Lyndon Johnson tapes was revealed in 1994, when the first batch of altogether 600 hours of his telephone conversations was released uncensored by his heirs. Johnson seems not to have cared whether publication would add luster to his reputation or damage it. But as the material becomes part of the record of the Johnson administration, it's clear that this will be the most complete record ever of an American presidency, and very probably the last of its kind. Keep watching. Discussion topics and activity and resources for the Johnson tapes on civil liberties are up next on Assignment Discovery.